Hello, welcome to Survive the Jive, and it's another Jive book review today. I'm looking at this book, The Final Pagan Generation by Edward Watts. I found it very interesting. It came out in 2015, and it tells the story of 4th century Rome, and the shift from the old religion, Christ, uh, paganism, the traditional religion of Rome, to the new one, Christianity, in a novel way, using the personal lives of four of the elites of what what's called the final pagan generation. And three of those men are pagans, and one is Christian. They are Libanius, Themistius, Praetextatus, and Ausonius. And he calls them the final pagan generation, not because they're all pagans, as one was a Christian, and not because they were the last pagans of Rome in that generation, because there were enduring pagans going on into the fifth century even, um, and maybe beyond in the countryside and such. But they're the last generation to live under a completely pagan Rome where Rome's where the, in, where the state of Rome was completely integrated with this traditional religion and um, that there was never, never any contemplation that that would ever change. It had been so, so for so many centuries that they could not imagine an alternative. And um, he contrasts the lives and careers of those men with those who came later, the younger men, who were um, born in the 330s, such as Chrysostom, Basil and Paulinus um, and these later generation who were reaching their um, you know prime in the later part of the fourth century were so different because for them Christianity had become much more a formal part of the state and it wasn't seen as just some you know another one of those weird cults that pops up and uh, this shift in culture is so fascinating to see analysed in this way. I will say against it that some of the... By focusing on these, the lives of these people, he sometimes diverges quite a long way from the topic. And he's more looking at these lives to show you that on the ground, they, we look back and we can see as this is a massive historical shift. But they didn't see it that way at the time. And... Um, they're just looking, they're just getting on with their lives. They're writing letters to try and get, you know, better jobs, trying to get um, references from older friends and relatives so that they can get an in to this job or that position there. They're, they've got very complicated social relationships that hold the social fabric of Rome and its elites together. And they're always concerned about that more than anything else. They're, they're, it's about money, you know, to, just like today, like elites care more about money than ideology or religion. And that is what we're seeing there. So if you're wanting to hear a book that explains the religious processes that, of the shift, it's not the right book for you. But that's actually quite, well, that's why I enjoyed it, because this book doesn't do what many, especially Christian uh, writers have tried to do, which is that they argue on completely false premises that the shift from paganism to Christianity was based on either the fact that there were more Christians than pagans, there weren't, that everybody just saw the, ine the, inevitable, uh, the inevitability that this shift had to happen because Christianity was somehow theologically superior or, or even that it was the ultimate true religion. They didn't. That wasn't the case at all. Um, rather, we're seeing a very small, at the early, you know, in the early parts of the fourth century, like no more than 20% of the population of Rome is Christian. But some of them hold key positions. And a series of far from inevitable, uh, but inter, uh, interconnected uh, events based on the actions of clever Christian elites, led to yet more and more Christian policies coming through. And as they gain more power, then they start to, towards the end of the fourth century, 
that's when they start really persecuting pagans. Because there is a narrative also among pagans that Christians, as soon as they achieved power, began to persecute pagans ruthlessly. But that isn't really what happened. They waited until they had a lot more power and that there was no... Then they started really, really persecuting pagans. The initial Christian... Um, the initial Christian emperor, uh, Constantine, only made some sort of um, symbolic uh, policy against paganism, which was never actually enforced. And what demonstrates how not only how it wasn't enforced, but how it could not have been enforced, uh, these like um, prohibitions against certain kinds of pagan worship. This is a majority pagan state and everyone's pagan. The temple stayed open. Everything continued as normal. For a while, anyway. There are clear parallels uh, with this cultural shift that's happened in the 4th century Rome with the enormous cultural shift that happened in America and other Western states during the 20th century and now into the 21st century we're seeing that reach its more violent stage. And um, not only have many of the people who reviewed this book made that connection, but the actual book itself does make that connection. Some other reviewers have pointed out that you could also compare this shift to England in the early modern era when you had that shift from medieval Catholicism into Protestantism. And that's certainly the case as well, where you have the state had this in, was integrated with the Catholic Church previously. And when, this, when the Protestants start seizing Catholic churches, the abolition of monasteries and things like that all contributed to a cultural shift to Protestantism in England. What we're seeing in what we've seen in modern times is um, the state appar apparatus in Western states has been um, gradually uh, absorbed and taken over by the new cultural religion of woke Marxian kind of ideology. And some of the old institutions that people who call themselves conservatives stand by, uh, they haven't really figured out yet that those institutions are actually against them, which is the same thing that happened with the pagans in Rome. They, for them, the state was part of their pagan religion and honouring the emperor was just as important as honouring the gods, even though they hadn't realised that the emperor was surrounded by powerful bishops who were working day and night to destroy everything they, they held dear. Uh, and the same kind of thing is happening now. But yeah, as I say, Watt actually makes a similar comparison in the book, but he doesn't go right into modern times. He just uses the example of the 1960s. He says something like, you know, when we think of the 60s, like nowadays we think of that cultural revolution, right? We think of like Woodstock and, you know, how this enormous cultural shift had happened in the 60s with hippies and everything, free love, a completely new attitude towards sex, new attitudes towards money, new attitudes towards nationhood, like John Lennon's kind of imagine and stuff like that, and Woodstock and free love and drugs and whatever. But if you're actually to look at the reality of 1960s America or Britain, it's not like that at all. Even um, Woodstock, for example, even the number of, the proportion of the population who were hippies or beatniks or whatever is only a small proportion of the population who were teenagers which is itself a tiny proportion of the population and of those that tiny proportion who are actually teenage hippies only an even smaller proportion got to go to Woodstock and what was the reality of Woodstock like for most of the people who went there he uses in the book an example of a photograph of these people having you know free love and stuff well, what we, they're watching uh, Janis Joplin or some hippie band. And, you know, the reality is that the sound quality probably wasn't that good. It was a bit rainy and muddy. Not everyone could probably hear what the band was like. Um, maybe not, not everyone was intoxicated. Maybe not everyone could afford the drugs or find any drugs. And um, maybe not all of them were fully aware that they were participating in a revolutionary movement that was changing the world. Um, the, this is the, rea the reality when you break it down is so much different. The average people in the 60s were not hippie revolutionaries on drugs. They were just normal conservative Americans or conservative British people who had no idea that the world was about to change permanently.
we look back on it and focus on the hippies as being like this revolutionary changing moment because we can see now how the ideology of those uh, extreme left wing and um, you know sort of cultural revolutionary people has influenced them on the world and when we retroactively go back and inflate the importance of those people and that culture at that time teleologically the same thing is what's happening with the fourth century because we know that the western world became christian so when we find the origins of christianity and when we see the first christian emperor emperor constantine we often have a tendency to assume that this was the inevitable explosion that caused a christian civilization to flourish but there is no inevitability there were all specific events and the reality is that the christians were only a tiny elite in the fourth century and they only can achieve power through Machiavellian techniques, certain sh sneaky ways, sometimes violent ways, some, you know, all sorts of different things, different people, different events happened that shaped that. So that's why I, uh, this book's really great, even though a lot of it is devoted to just letters going back and forth between teachers and their pupils or friends in, one, in Antioch writing to their friends in Alexandria or Constantinople and trying to get favours and stuff. But that's the background that Watts is trying to help you understand, to, to see the reality of why Rome became Christian. What he shows is that pagans had, as the worshipping temples became more difficult, there were prohibitions against sacrifice. Initially, these weren't enforceable, as I said, but um, later ones were enforceable and I mean, Julian came to power and started to roll back some of those those things, but I'll get into that later. Before Julian, the destruction of temples hadn't been ordered, but it had been sort of sanctioned where it was okay to use the stones from decaying temples. Um, but generally, people were still going into temples, they were still sacrificing. But later on, when they start really, you know, attacking the temples and banning sacrifice, um, the, the, then the pagans had to retreat to the household, the oikos, and that's where um, ritual spaces continued to be preserved, which was in small household shrines. So paganism didn't die out completely in the 4th century, it just became a more private thing, which is where you get the, the kind of term pagan, paganus, meaning like countryside dweller, because it's in rural secluded areas where people could carry on doing these sorts of practices without being interfered with by the state, which was then Christian. There was at one point a ban on blood sacrifices, but that was not just because blood sacrifice is abominable to the Christian perspective, but also because many of the sacrifices had been state activities funded by the state. And as the state was becoming more and more Christian and populated by Christian officials, it, they couldn't justify it to themselves that they were participating in uh, this, this, this paganism. So, at, in fact, some blood, blood sacrifices did carry on in the sense that, you know, a farmer could still blood, you, you know, kill an animal if he wanted. It was more the state sacrifices that were ba being banned at first. But even then, um, the early prohibitions didn't ban the offering of incense to the gods. So the Christians actually, you know, were kind of okay with pagans offering incense to the gods. And even later on, when they talk about, uh, you know, destroying the temples, they even say some of the temples should be, and statues within should be preserved on the, for their artistic merit, which is, I think, quite interesting because it reflects a much later Christian view in the Renaissance and beyond, where we um, consider you know, pagan imagery okay in Christian um, civilization because of its artistic merit. One of the influential figures in the de-paganization uh, de of Rome was Eusebius, and he uh, interestingly inv invokes the Jews as a justification for the de-paganization because um, it says, uh, Eusebius knew about uh, a religious group claimed to have successfully suppressed and established traditional religion that precedent is what he uses. This was the account of the Israelite conquest of Canaan in Deuteronomy, a story in which God commanded his people to demolish completely all the places where the nations whom you are about to dispossess served their gods. Eusebius imagined that Roman paganism would die away in the same way that traditional Canaanite religion did if sacrifice was restricted 
temples torn down and the emperor readied churches for the new Christians his policies would create. Um, Eusebius's dream didn't uh, manifest in his lifetime, but as the book shows, those, those kind of policies were eventually enforced and that is what happened. So it was certainly inspired by um, Old Testament Jewish uh, behaviours towards their enemies. One of the emperors that we look at is Constantius, who actually was more anti-pagan than Constantine. In fact, of the early Christian emperors, Constantine was probably the mildest, the, the least extreme, um, probably because he was the first and he was still ruling over a largely pagan populace. Also, of course, he had been a pagan himself. He had converted, so maybe he had a bit more sympathy to the pagans. But uh, here it states that uh, the Theodosian Code preserved a set of laws issued by Constantius that lays out a series of anti-pagan principles. The first law dates to the period when the presence of Constans still moderated Constantius's religious initiatives. In 341, the two emperors issued a simple prohibition of sacrifice that commands, superstition shall cease, the madness of sacrifices shall be abolished, for if any man, in violation of the law of the sainted emperor Constantine, our father, and in violation of the command of our clemency, should dare to perform sacrifices, he shall suffer the infliction of a suitable punishment and the effect of an immediate sentence. So this law restates Constantine's nomos from the 320s, um, but differs from it by adding an unspecified penalty that was so well defined that it rendered the law effectively unenforceable. So even though Constantine had made the same law about banning sacrifices, it had never been enforced. There wasn't even a penalty prescribed in the law. And then in the 340s, you've got uh, Constantius actually reinforcing it with a punishment, but it still probably wasn't actually enforced uh, because it wasn't e e easily enforceable. It's, um, as I say, later on that people get really punished. And I think it's perhaps hubristic of the pagans to not realise that these laws were such a threat because they were just seeing, okay, the laws are being made, but they're not actually being enforced, so we should relax. But they should have gone to much greater lengths to prevent such laws being, uh, being enacted in the first place, realising the potential threat. But of course, they had never heard of a world in which paganism wasn't the main religion. It just wasn't, it couldn't even be imagined. But then it says, after Constance was gone, Constantius was able to enforce more brutal uh, suppression of uh, pagan practices. In 356, he took the important legislative step of prescribing actual penalties for sacrifices. Theodosian Code 16.10.6, a law of February 20th, 356, were claimed. If any person should be proven to devote their attention to sacrifices or to the worship of images, we command that they be subjected to capital punishment. But then between 355 and 361, the pagans get some light, they get a chance for change. Emperor Julian comes in, Constantius's cousin. Emperor Julian was a pagan, a Neoplatonist, and he, his rise was a lot like that of Constantine had been at the beginning of the century. Um, both converted from a different faith, so Julian had been raised a Christian, uh, whereas Constantine had been raised a pagan, and both believed that they overcame adversity thanks to divine intervention. So in, in Constantine's case, he thought that Christ helped him conquer uh, in, in the sign you will conquer, whereas Julian believed that he, against all odds, um, somehow became emperor. Uh, his cousin probably was, you know, plotting against him. It's quite likely he was going to be killed, but uh, a, a series of completely improbable events, military and otherwise, uh, described in the book, re resolved in Julian coming to power. And um, he attributes that to the intervention of the gods, and he says so publicly. Um, and he immediately starts to roll back the more oppressive uh, legislation that his cousin had put into place. Um, and uh, but his and he put some more policies in place himself, but rather like Trump, he just was not that effective at changing the cultural momentum that had been started. I mean, on the ground, he did make some good changes, like get rid of some of the legislation that had resulted in the destruction of temples. And the other thing he did is he 
put legislation in place to prevent Christians from becoming teachers. Now you think that's great, he's a clever guy. He understood that paganism needed to be a revolutionary movement that reclaimed the institutions that the Christians had started to infiltrate. But the average pagan didn't understand that. And the average pagan was, as I said, just a normal guy concerned with his day-to-day life. And he didn't, he wouldn't think in the way that Julian did about the long term. And the result was that actually Julian's policies were not effective and they even backfired. For ex- because both of the two examples I've given interfered with the social networks and relationships uh, around which the the elite Roman society was based. For example, he said that anyone who has used stone from the temples to build their houses must have their houses deconstructed and the stone's got to go back to the temples. Sounds like a good policy and a lot of pagans thought that was great but a lot of the pagans were writing to Julian and saying, please make an exception for my Christian friend or my pagan friend even who took those stones because that temple was completely out of use and blah, blah, blah. And you're going to ruin his house. And they're writing those not just because they really like their friends, but because they're obligated by the social relationships of Rome where you, you're you constantly indebted to people for favours. Everyone's exchanging favours. And you have to, regardless of what religion that person is, re restore those favors that's how everything works so even if you're like really happy that there's a pagan emperor julian in power really happy to see that he's um rolling back some of the christian legislation you still have to oppose that legislation whenever it inconveniences one of your the members of your social network to whom you're indebted and so that's what they did and the same thing happened where where julian tried to exclude Christians from teaching because the teaching the teachers were all elites and they're you know like indebted to one another so whenever one of them is being taken out of power he's calling in favors from all his friends pagan or Christian and they're writing to Julian saying you've got to make an exception for this guy you've got to make an exception for this guy and that's the problem because Julian understood what needed to happen in terms of Paganism had to change to become revolutionary in order to defeat Christianity. But he only his ideas of policy were all running against the grain of the actual culture of Rome, which was all about social networks, and that meant it was doomed, and um, and they didn't have long-lasting effects after he died. Uh, I'll read a bit from the book about what it says about Julian. Julian ordered that the temples should be opened, sacrifices brought to their altars, and the worship of the old gods restored. A pagan emperor again ruled the world. He convened a tribunal of five men in Chalcedon and charged it with investigating high officials who may have abused power in the later years of Constantius's reign. So he even started to bring some of these men to justice. I've described Julian several times as revolutionary, but actually uh, what goes against that here, saying... Um, uh, sacrifices were reinstituted, temples were reopened, and Nicene bishops were recalled to their sees. Because Julian forcefully advocated his pagan beliefs, these actions have been seen as somehow revolutionary. They were not. The empire had nominally prohibited sacrifices since at least 324, but the first law against sacrifices with enforceable penalties appeared only five years before Julian's accession. And while the law was technically enforceable, Not only do we know of no person ever prosecuted under that law, but we have a great deal of evidence that public sacrifices continued to be performed between 356 and 361. Theodosian Code 1610-4, which forbids access to temples, similarly seems not to have been widely enforced, even if it was technically enforceable. In these cases, Julian simply reversed an ineffective policy that had been in place for only a relatively short time. You're seeing he actually wasn't making as great a change as it seems. Like Rome was still largely pagan before Julian came into power on the ground. So these changes from Christian to pagan emperors weren't the big changes that we somehow sometimes are told they were. But the it's all about the shifts in power at the top and those ultimately lead to big changes on the ground. On the uh, subject of the networks I discussed. 
This tendency to look out for the interests of friends, even when they conflicted with Julian's religious reforms, can be explained by more than the simple cronyism that the later Roman system encouraged. Julian was looking to institutionalise traditional religion in ways that were both unprecedented and somewhat alien. His paganism honoured traditional gods with festivals and sacrifices at reconsecrated sacred sites, but it differed from the system into which the final pag pagan generation was born. In that system, festivals were common but not obligatory. Priesthoods were decentralised, and the marble and bricks from decrepit temples could be quietly recycled. Most elites neither understood Julian's inflexibility nor sympathised with his efforts to legally disadvantage Christians because of what they believed. Many of the people born in the 310s wanted the temples open, but they did not want this process to be terribly disruptive. That's so typical of conservatives, isn't it? They want, the, they want to restore the good old stuff, but they don't want to do it in a way that would require any, anything too extreme. And that is a problem that Julian ran into, I suppose. You can say, perhaps, that um, it wasn't that Julian was unworthy of Rome, but that Rome was unworthy of Julian. So uh, after Julian's gone, it just things get worse and worse for the pagans. Um, I'll skip towards the end and just read you something regarding um, the 380s. It was actually Theodosius who was the one who really started to destroy temples all over the empire, not in a way that Constantine or Constantius had ever done anything like that. It was much later that that really started to happen. Prudentius saw the Theodosian era temple destructions as the final step that prefigured a rush to the church. John Chrysotum and Gregory Nazianzen claimed that the actions of Theodosius formed a sort of persuasion that would lead to traditional religion collapsing in on itself. This was, of course, the path toward a Christian empire first pr proposed by Eusebius back in the, in the 320s, and the one that had guided imperial policy in the 340s and 350s. Now, however, the push took on a new form. Change was affected not by laws issued from the court, but by actions taken by monks, bishops and other Christians who operated outside its political constraints. This was what particularly troubled Libanius. He knew how to mobilise his network of friends to protest against and slow down the implementation of anti-pagan measures that came through official channels. It was far more difficult to respond effectively to situations in which imperial officials like Cunegius encouraged uh, extra-legal actions taken by monks, bishops and other, others outside the imperial system. This was asymmetrical religious warfare that Libanius and his peers were ill-equipped to fight. They could not match the tactics of their opponents, but Libanius still responded as forcefully as he could. Oration 30, a text that apparently dates to the period immediately following Cunegius's departure from Syria, serves as Libanius's first effort to respond to this new and troubling dynamic. Libanius then describes how the current situation corresponds to the policies regarding temples set by the emperors who ruled during his lifetime. He starts with Constantine, an emperor whose embrace of Christianity caused absolutely no alteration in the traditional forms of worship. Libanius then moves to Constantius. He acknowledges that Constantius banned sacrifices, but he asserts that this happened simply because the weak emperor was dominated by his eunuchs and court attendants. Julian restored sacrifice, but Valentinian and Valens restricted it again, permitting only the offering of incense. Theodosius, Libanius claims, has upheld this policy. He, also, he has also neither ordered the closure of temples nor banned entrance to them. However, the black-robed tribe, who eat more than elephants, hasten to attack the temples with sticks and stones and bars of iron, and in some cases disdaining these with hands and feet. Then utter desolation follows. These were, of course, the monks who, Libanius later makes clear, were encouraged in these actions by bishops. This is, Libanius asserts, not only an illegal action, but one that is nothing less than war in peacetime waged against the peasantry. An effective emperor must stop it. Now, I probably don't have to uh, let it on 
it's too thickly for you to imagine who the equivalent of these monks and bishops are. So Theodosius, uh, I say he destroyed temples, but he didn't actually make policy to destroy temples. However, he did when he was touring the empire, he brought with him all these monks and wherever they went, they destroyed sacred grove. They cut down sacred groves. They destroyed temples. They smashed idols like, a, you know, a force of iconoclasm just uh, laying waste to all this cultural heritage. So did Theodosius prevent them from doing that? Did he say anything against them? No, he was perfectly happy to watch that happen. And the bishops who surrounded him were encouraging the monks to do that. Now, we can see in America how the Democrat Party sometimes does the same thing, allowing, uh, you know, people, groups like BLM and Antifa to completely eliminate statues, destroy cultural heritage. And then when they commit criminal acts, when they kill people, when they kill police officers, when they uh, destroy public property, they can say, oh, we did nothing. We didn't do this. This is this group of extremists. But they are the ones who, uh, you know, built this ideology and have been per perpetuating it and encouraging it. And these um, groups become the shock troops for the social and ideological changes that the, the elites are trying to enforce. And that's exactly what happened in Rome. And uh, there's some valuable lessons from history in this book. So, uh, yeah, I think it's definitely worth a read, worth a read if you um, want to learn more about the conversion of Rome and also if you want a little warning from history. OK, um, I hope to see you for my next video. I've got a two part series coming up about Anglo-Saxon paganism soon, and that's going to be really thorough and interesting. Don't forget to click subscribe and to become a patron on Patreon or subscribe start if you want to get access to loads of exclusive videos where I discuss all kinds of interesting things and I do uh, personal live stream AMAs for my patrons uh, or if you just want to give me a little bit of money to help me out you can donate via PayPal or you can donate via crypto I accept Bitcoin, Chainlink, Monero, whatever. Anyway, see you next time.